Good morning. I'm not gonna lie, it is not terribly easy to get up on a day that you know is gonna go like today well. And I'm not being a cynic or, or pessimistic. It's gonna be a hard day. <laughs> so what I've done is tried to make a very specific sequence of events for today so I don't get too stressed about the mediation at two o'clock. I met with the little fur monster who I love. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna bring her home. I'm gonna shower, I'm gonna go to school for a bunch of hours while there. I will, you know, kind of bounce back and forth between thinking about mediation, getting my head straight there, and getting ready for tomorrow, the first day of school. It, God, this is a terrible sequence to mediate the day before I start back to school. I don't know why I agreed to it. It's one of those, like I should have known better at the time and I should have said like, no, it's not gonna work for me, but I didn't. I was trying to be accommodating and that seems to be my mistake through this whole thing. I don't know what kind of state I'll be in after mediation. After the first one, I felt kind of okay. I was really stressed going in and then I left and I thought like, all right, that was not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. But I'm anticipating today to be bad. I don't know how long it'll last. The first one lasted two hours, the second one lasted three hours. I don't know how dug in and nitty gritty we'll get today. I'm not in a rush to get this thing done, so I don't care. I need to keep remembering that. I don't care, it doesn't matter. I'm not buying property in Northern California. I'm not in a new relationship. I don't have time sensitive things. I would like to sell the condo because we have to and just to have that off my plate, but I don't care. It's my wife that's doing all the things that are time sensitive. It's my wife that's doing all the things out of sequence, really inappropriate for, for someone in her position. She's, she's still married. You should not be buying property with somebody else when you're still married. Why does it have to, have to happen so quickly? What, what, slow it down? Maybe she has a reason, but since she won't tell me anything anymore, I don't understand it. And on that, on that note, she won't tell me anything, so why would I at all try to be accommodating? The only reason I'd be helpful is because I'm used to being helpful. She's been cruel to me, so I'm definitely anxious. <laughs> God, it sucks so bad. Because it's just out there, you know, it's less than eight hours from now. It's, it's inevitable, it is coming. So I just need to do what I can before then and then go see what happens. I don't think I will ever feel prepared enough because I don't understand the process. I think my paperwork's fine, but aside from hiring an attorney to look at my paperwork and be like, good boy, you, you did a great job. I don't know, you know, I'm not a legal mind. I just wanted to let you know where my head's at this morning. I hope you're gonna have a great day and I will, I will see more later. Okay, bye. After I went skydiving, I went out to lunch and I just had this urge to tell everybody I saw, I just jumped out of a plane. I just went skydiving. Like I was so adrenalized. I just wanted to tell everyone. And I realized nobody's gonna be like, oh my God, that's incredible. You're amazing. Like nobody cares. <laughs> and I have the same urge right now. Uh, I was just in the elevator with a woman who was like, oh, we're, we're halfway through the week. And I wanted to be like, yeah, but I'm getting divorced today. Nobody care, you know, it's uniquely special to, to me, but to anybody else, it's just another tale of somebody getting divorced. So what kind of lesson can we take from that? I feel like this is a really, really, really big deal. Today's a really, really big day to me. It, it, it matters more than most of the days in my life. It's, it's significant and scary and hard for me. And for everybody else, it's like a Wednesday. So what would be meaningful to me right now? If people remembered, people are like, hey, good luck today. I know it's gonna be hard. That would mean so much to me. Yeah, so how can we carry this forward? What would be meaningful to me today would be for people to remember me and people to wish me well. If I had my dream this morning, that's what would happen. And I guess that, that's what we need to carry forward, or that's what I need to carry forward to other people. Just the continual remembrance that everyone's individual problems are the biggest deal to them. Today's a really big deal, a really big day to me. I'm really sensitive to emotions. I'm really sensitive to pain. I'm really sensitive to kindness from people. It all means a lot. What I want right now is, is thought and kindness from others. So going forward, when I know people are going through a tough time, I want to remember the details, the specifics, and reach out to them more than I think I should because it's meaningful. At this moment right now, I'm really lonely and I'm really, <laughs> I'm teetering. Like I'm on the edge of falling apart. And by falling apart, I mean just breaking down and crying a bit. You know, I wouldn't hurt myself for any of that. And what I need to do in the next 
Oh God, six hours. I need to back away from this teetering edge that I'm on and build some kind of strong foundation, however temporary, to be ready for this day. And my hope is that the activity and the paperwork and the solidifying things and putting down on paper what I want out of this breakup and just doing all that will, will strengthen my resolve. I hope so, it's all I got. And I hope that in that time, some people say kind things. And maybe I'm unusual, I don't really know. But I mean, we are human and social creatures. We want, we want love and kindness and affection. When you need it, accept it from other people. And when you think somebody else might need it, just give it, just, just be open and give it. It takes work or courage. You know, so many times I hear people talk about like, oh, I didn't know what I should do. I didn't know if I blah, blah, blah. Like people get scared of connecting with other people. And I understand, you know, like, I get it. it. It can be scary. You don't want to reach out to somebody and fear that they'll reject you, but I don't think they will. When people are hurting, I mean, think about it. Like, if somebody is hurting and you reach out and just say like, hey, are you doing okay? They're not gonna be like, shut up, go away, you're a loser. They're, they're not. And I think people have the fear that they're not close enough to the person to take care of them. Or like, somebody's hurting, but I'm not, you know, I'm not one of their good friends. I don't think it matters. I think when you're hurting, you need all the friends you can get. You need people to rally around you. You need to have a support net. You need to feel taken care of. So if you're in need, ask for it, accept it. And if somebody's in need, just give. What struck me the most in this process are the people that make bold moves and courageous moves and continual moves. Some people who I know are my friends I haven't heard from in months. I'm sure that they care about me. And you know, they, they said months ago, if I need anything, call them. And I would, I would, if I was desperate. But I think in terms of helping other people, that's the first tier. Hey, if there's anything I can do, let me know. That's, that's tier one. That's saying, I'm here for you, but I'm not going to actively do anything. I care about you and I will do whatever I'm told to do. And that's awesome. You like, like collect as many of those people as you can because that's an awesome base. And if you need those people, call them. I made a list in my phone. I made a list called people I can talk to. <laughs> I did. And every person I could think of that I could call if I was low or desperate is on that list. Sometimes maybe you're alone. So you scroll down the list and you're like, I've talked to all these people. I haven't talked to this person. Or maybe, I mean, you know the people, so you can sort of select what kind of support you want and then call that person and, and talk to them. I've spent a lot of time on the phone in the past couple months and I will spend a lot of time on the phone in the coming months, I'm sure. That's been good. You know, maybe tier two is people that actively seek you out, actively text you, call you and check on you. And then tier three might be people that actively seek you out and bring you out. Like, come on, let's go do this. Come on, I'll come over. Come on, I'll bring you food. And I think those people are more rare. And quite honestly, I don't know that I've been that person very well in the past, but I aspire to be. Going forward, I will try harder to be that person. You know, and I had a friend go through a breakup after I went through a breakup and was in a low place. So I took him out to dinner. And it was a tough dinner. I was in a low place. He was in a low place. We're not such like bros that conversation just flows. Like it took, it took work. You know, I didn't come away from it being like, damn, that was awesome. But it was necessary. And I, you know, I didn't do it for me, I did it for him. You know, and there were periods where we sat in silence. Either, you know, contemplative silence or don't know what to say silence. And I think, I think those are okay too. You know, if you're in the company of others,
You know, I know what it feels like to be alone in a group. I would like someone to pat me on the back and tell me I'm doing it well, to tell me I'm doing it right, to tell me that all this paperwork and legal, legal stuff I'm doing, I'm not making mistakes. I'm not missing something obvious. That's what I could use right now because I don't know if I'm doing it right. You know, I'm doing it to the best of my ability, to the best of my knowledge, but I don't know. You know, I don't know if I'm gonna get there and I will have missed something obvious. It's with no self-confidence that I'm going into this meeting and that, that stinks. So, it's like you're not confident about the technical side of things and then the whole interaction between me and my wife is a wild card because I don't know where her brain is. I don't know if she'll be logical or, or emotional or wild or not make any sense. I don't know if she's gonna lash out, if she's gonna be icy cold. You know, I make some predictions based on previous meetings, but I don't know. I haven't seen her to talk to since the day before her surgery. So that would have been, that would have been more than a month, which is good. The longer I go without seeing her, the better I seem to do. I will be seeing her today, which means tomorrow and probably Friday, I will suffer. It's just what I do. Things I know going in, I don't have to sign anything. I won't sign anything. <laughs> That's a big one. And I can walk away if I don't feel like it's good for me. I've consulted with an attorney, he thinks, I'm in good shape. The thing I'm scared about is telling her no. She's just ex expecting I'm gonna sign this thing and I'm just gonna say no. It'd be bad for her. But see, part of my heart is still very tied to her. So I will feel bad making her feel bad. And I know, I know it's stupid, but it, it is true because there's part of me that just wants to give her what she wants. Like, I'd love to make her happy, but not today. I was gonna put the camera away and uh, just go home, but I'm nervous. So I wanna talk to you. I wanna talk to anyone. And uh, I like talking to you. I hope it's useful and interesting. When I was little, I took piano lessons and I liked playing piano. I like learning how to play songs, and I like the way that after a while, it became part of your muscle memory. You know, you could just, you could just make music. I liked that. I liked that it became part of you. But then every year we would have to do a recital, and I would get so incredibly nervous. And the recitals became, and maybe this is being dramatic, but, but I liked playing piano less because I would have to do a recital at the end of the year. And it wasn't an option to not, you know, as a kid. I don't know what the thinking is exactly, but, but basically, I like to play piano, but I didn't like to play in front of people. I like to play for me. And what I'm feeling right now is sort of that. I think about the end of my marriage all the time. I think about the technicalities of it. I think about everything. It's what I think about most of the time. And I've imagined this day for months. And I've thought about it, and I've tried to do all the planning and preparation and, and be in it and have all the comebacks and all the things I want to say. <sighs> but today's like the recital. Today is the performance of the thing I've been preparing for. And it's not... Oh my God, she is parked at the fucking house. Again. Are you fucking kidding me? Oh, this girl. This fucking girl. She hasn't parked here in more than a month. Day of mediation, she's parked here. Of course she is. Sorry, I got a little upset there. Um, let's try and unpack why. She, to my knowledge, is not parked here at the condo in more than a month. She works where she works. She lives where she lives. She's not been parking here. She knows it upsets me when she parks at the building. We discussed that early on. So, on this technical day of mediation, when it's gonna be hard, I think everyone recognizes it's gonna be hard. Why did she park at the building today? I can think of two reasons. The loving husband reason, she was only coming to town for a little while and it wasn't worth paying to park at her office since she'd only be here for a half day. That's the nicest answer I can come up with. Number two, because she knows it will mess with my head and upset me and throw me off my game for mediation. And I hate thinking like that, but I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility. 
I think that's why the ego ties into it too. I used to be part of a family that had a like a, a cool convertible. Like I could just go down and take that car and go out for a drive anywhere I wanted and feel kind of amazing driving a convertible in Southern California. It was kind of perfect. And I think it's really easy to let things like that make you feel good about yourself. It was just cool, you know? And you think like, my life is cool. I have a great life. So not that you're defined by your possessions, but to have cool things in your life makes your life feel cooler so you feel cooler. Does that make sense? And then all at once it all gets taken away. So you feel less cool. And your wife goes away and you feel less loved. And you're alone so you feel less attractive and less desirable. And your confidant goes away. And you're sort of your social partner so you feel less you feel less sociable and less less competent socially like it, it all it all it was all so knitted together and then gets so torn apart with these jagged straggly ends that take a long time and a lot of work to figure out how to how to resolve and in the midst of that in the places that I can't resolve yet I'm working to be okay with not being resolved to be okay to be in pain to be alone to feel these feelings I feel like I keep telling myself like it's okay a certain part of life is pain and I'm learning to accept it and sit with it. It sucks, it sucks so much. And I just have to hold on to that blind belief that, that it's all greater good, it's all moving through something towards an end where I will be okay. And sometimes in the midst of that, quite often in the midst of that, I still think about her thinking how unfair it is that she seems to have it all going for her, that she's got it all going on. She has a relationship. She's buying very expensive property. She's changing her life. She, she will be funded for the rest of her life. She was able to just shut me down and shut me out in a way that I have trouble even comprehending, Never mind understanding. Let's draw strength from this experience. I'm driving back down to the parking garage. And I'm parking next to the white car for what I assume will be the last time. In terms of relationship role playing or marriage role playing, this will be the last time this one gets played. The last time I come down and look right and see the white car and park carefully next to it and get that little buzz of maybe she'll be upstairs. Ready? There it is. Got the little buzz. I can feel it in my chest like, oh, this is what my life looked like six months ago. And that's it. There's the car. All right, friends, let's go do the work we gotta do and then do the heavier lifting we have to do. Yeah. All right, in terms of a quick update, she left the house before I did. I went down to get in the car and she was gone. In terms of me checking in, I'm anxious. It's all present. It's all like up in my shoulders and my back. I can just feel it kind of like tingling and tensing those muscles. It's all right there. I'm as ready as I can be. Now it's about my acuity and sharpness and ability to respond to what she says. I think my lack of fear in throwing in personal and emotional asides. If she's rude to me, she didn't like last time when I, when I mentioned personal things. So I'm gonna do that. She doesn't want to hire attorneys, but I'm willing to do that. I'm not going into this with any hope. Like, I don't hope for her to all of a sudden love me or all of a sudden come back. I mean, in a way, I'd like for today to be the end of the story, but it won't be. There's no way it'll be. So I'm wearing, I'm wearing the shirt that I got for my honeymoon that I was too big to wear on my honeymoon, which I think I wore to the last mediation. I think this is me being really consistent with me and my symbolic thinking, I think. I will not sign anything today. It's weird, I'm gonna see her in 35 minutes. And I wonder after today, how long will it be? Like, when will they move? When will the next time I see her be? Will it be longer? It's strange driving this road into La Jolla. I remember driving into La Jolla to get married. It was the night of a rehearsal. Yeah. And we were a little late because the person that was fixing my tie was slow and it just, so we were rushing to get there, but we were listening to I'm on a boat by Lonely Island. And I just remember thinking, how cool is it that I'm driving to my wedding with a woman that one, thinks it's cool, and two, knows all the words to I'm on a boat. And we were just singing out loud, I'm on a boat, driving to get married. And it was a great moment. It was like, God, we are so compatible. We are so great together. It's a really fun memory. This is an odd trio of memories where I'm driving into La Jolla alone to mediate my divorce. 
I guess it's a fitting sort of bookend to the driving in together to get married. I wonder what I don't know right now. I feel prepared, I feel like I've done as much as I can at this moment. Two or three hours when I'm driving out of La Jolla, what will have been revealed that I don't know now? You can't know what you don't know, but what's gonna happen in the next little bit? What new facet of this situation will we see? What new information will be revealed? What will she say that stabs me in the heart in a way I didn't think was possible? And I try and think through all those possibilities too so I can't get wrecked. When I got married, I made it right on that street. But if you wanna get divorced, you go straight. And then right, and then left, and then right, and then right into the parking garage, up the elevator, and then sit awkwardly in the lobby. Off camera, I'm like wringing my hands. I am nervous. It's so funny, every year I get nervous about the start of school and, and just, you know, the sort of self-doubt of like, oh, am I gonna be able to do it again? Am I gonna remember how to be a teacher? I have none of that right now. All of that's a given. Like, of course I can teach, you know, I'll go in tomorrow and we'll do a first day thing and, and we'll do some sketching and it's gonna be great. I think there's a lesson in that in terms of being debilitated by your own neuroses or your own self-doubt. When something bigger comes along, as is the case now, the volume on the other stuff just gets turned down. I will go in tomorrow and start school confidently. Maybe I'll be a little nervous tomorrow after this is done, but it certainly doesn't have the same weight that it's had other years. That's cool. Ah, uh, 24 minutes. I keep thinking morbid things like, dead man walking. I do definitely feel like I'm driving towards my doom, and I don't have any option but to take the path I'm taking. I have to go to where I'm going, this thing is going to happen, and then we'll all drive away into traffic. Okay, I'm five minutes out. I've read all my notes. I've done everything I can do. I'm gonna go do this thing. I will see you shortly after it's over. Wish me luck. All right, so that was crazy. Uh, let me just talk about what immediately just happened. At the end of mediation, she was starting to cry and break down. She can't believe I won't sign the quick claim for her. We left mediation. She went straight out to the elevators. She was wearing an orange polka dot dress. And I went down the staircase, and the staircase doesn't go all the way to the parking garage. So I had to get in the elevator on the, the courtyard level. I did, I hit the button, and when the elevator opened, she was standing there. So I stepped in the elevator, and she raised her hand to be like, I can't even, and just walked out of the elevator past me. Okay. Leaving the parking garage, I ended up immediately behind her driving out. Her credit cards didn't seem to work in the machine, so the parking attendant just buzzed her out, just let her out, because she wins all the time. I paid my $9 for parking and then drove out, and I ended up behind her on the street, driving out of La Jolla. I was behind her waiting to make a left onto uh, La Jolla Village Parkway. I think that's what it is. She was first at the light, I was second, I was behind her. I think she was gonna make a left, she was waiting at the light. And she must have noticed me in the mirror because she, <laughs> she cut the wheel to the right and gunned it and just took off to the right. Like it was crazy. Yep. And uh, now I'm gonna go to the barn. So mediation. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, I went up, got out of the elevator. She was sitting in the lobby. I looked at her and I said, hello. And she said nothing back. She's wearing an orange dress with white polka dots. Um, her hair looked really pretty. I noticed that during the mediation and the mediator came out and greeted us and said something about getting the notary. You know, she's like, oh, we'll call what's his face and the notary to come in. And I just said, um, well, I'm not gonna sign anything until we have an agreement. And there was just this sort of like beat where people were like, what? And then we walked into the conference room and she went into talking about how it's not signing a quick claim for, for each other, you know, when it's separate property and doesn't involve anything, um, is pretty standard practice. And I said, I, I've just been advised not to until this is settled. And then they both kind of went into talking about how if she loses this property, I'll be liable for it and this and that. And I said, okay. <laughs> I mean, I trust my attorney. That's why you hire an attorney, right? Because you trust somebody who knows more than you. This was the first I'd heard about the, the property and the, signing that. So, yeah, no, I'm not just going to go sign it. Um, she was pretty visibly upset at the fact that I would just sign 
whatever she wanted me to sign. Then the mediator wanted to go into talking about the, my counter offer. I wanted to do disclosures first. So we did all the technicalities of disclosing stuff, which is just a lot of signing and passing of papers. But I asked why we didn't disclose last time, and she said she didn't think we were done. And she claims that she was. She thought I just had lots of questions. And it, it, it was just funny. Like, I don't know how there was a miscommunication or disconnect there, because I was clearly in very good shape last time. I don't know. I don't get it. And she, you know, my wife claimed that, yeah, she had all her stuff together. So something was off, but whatever. We disclosed this time. And she wanted to talk about the counter offer, and I, I asked her to review how we got to the number we got to last time. Oh, I said that I didn't think the, the Watson Epstein stuff was applicable. Pretty condescendingly. I was like, who are you getting your advice from? She was basically like, are you talking to idiots? Like, are you getting idiot advice? And I was sort of like, no, I'm good. Man, she can be condescending with not, without even knowing she's being condescending. It's, uh, it's wild. And then we were gonna talk about the counter offer and I asked for a breakout session because she was also like really, she's like, I need to come back to the, you know, this needs to get signed. This is really important. This has to be done soon, blah, blah, blah. It was a pretty repetitive theme. She, she, wanted, she wanted what she wanted. Um, she wanted the thing signed today and couldn't believe that I wouldn't just sign it. So we had a breakout session where I was really candid with, with the mediator and I said, she's, she's claimed I'm bleeding her dry, she's claiming this and that, she's got all this money in her account. We reviewed stuff and we went over numbers and we kind of reevaluated things and looked at stuff and um, well all of a sudden we came out with a buyout number that was twice what the buyout number was last time. Which is good, but it's still basically saying here's $1,000, go away. And maybe I need to remove emotion from it and just think, all right, that thousand dollars, that's awesome. But it doesn't feel right. And I could be totally wrong with that. I don't know. I need to talk to my attorney. Did disclose that she put $50,000 into the property. And she said, but she, you know, she'll get that back once the condo sells. But that's not even equivalent. Like that doesn't make any sense. So you did put money into the property. It's, it's a little hard to know who to believe but I'm gonna to choose to believe my attorney. The whole Watts Epstein thing, they definitely think I'm on the hook for, and my attorney definitely thinks I'm not. So what do you do? I don't know. At one point, he said something to me about, you know, there should be communication, so I'm not feeding my, so I'm not feeding my attorney like the wrong information. And it was just, it was heavy with this, this assumption that like I'm dumb and I'm just, I'm not telling him the right stuff because she's an attorney and I'm a teacher. She also told the mediator, yeah, the mediator was like, his opinion is basically like, you're an adult and you should be able to provide for yourself. And she provided a lot of fun stuff over the years. So why, am, why do I want even more? The mediator tried to resolve the situation by offering or wanting to talk to my attorney on the phone, you know, like, like kind of get him abreast of the situation and fill him in. I'm totally fine with that made some comment about, yeah, or he'll try and just get us out of mediation so he can charge more. And uh, the mediator, to her credit, said, um, you know, there's definitely people out there that do that, but the guy I have is, uh, he has a really good reputation for being like a good guy. He's, he's made his mark, he's made his money, and now he's just, he's just trying to do right by people. And, and you know, and I was like, yes, thank you confirm the way I feel about him. Like, he's a good guy. He's a moral center. It was a really excellent thing to hear her say about my guy. I mean, she probably still thinks I have some monster, but at least she knows that my guy has a, enjoys a good reputation in the legal community. I think she's definitely feeling trapped. Like, she's not getting what she wants. She's desperate. Like, her voice started to freak out. She just wants to move on with her life. I'm standing in the way of her life. And it, every time she says it, it's weird because her life used to be my life. You know, we used to have a life together. And she kept keeps saying things like, you know, none of this has anything to do with me. None of this has anything to do, like, basically it's none of my business. And that feels bad because I'm married to her. So I do care, but she is definitely not married to me. I had a whole box of caramel popcorn because I hadn't eaten today and I was shaky and weird. So she had this like Harry and David popcorn that was really good. There went my diet.
didn't get a chance to, or, or maybe I was wise enough not to bring up the whole the fact that she kept telling me I'm bleeding her dry, yet she had, at times, more than in the bank. I think it's probably wise to play my cards close to my vest as long as I can. I know there were times at which she was staring at me today, and I just didn't put my head up, I just didn't look at her. It's funny how somebody can be the most beautiful person you've ever seen, and then after all she does, I look at her and I'm like, definitely not the most beautiful person I've ever seen. Like, character really can color somebody's beauty. She's definitely in a panic, though. I can hear it. She was like, I need a, I need a date and time when, when we're gonna get this signed. And she had that, like, franticness that I know really, really well. I'm talking to her. I was like, as long as it's approved, I said, it's still me. Like, you know me. I said, I'll, I'll meet you whenever. You can do it after school on Monday. I, I don't care. I'm not trying to, like, ruin your life. But see, that falls on deaf ears. So she fixates on the negative things. In the moments where I'm kind, it's like I'm not even talking. It's like that's the default, so she doesn't appreciate it. It's only when I do things that are not expected that she goes bonkers. She doesn't do well when things are, are not as expected. She's making a case right now, I'm sure, that I'm being retaliatory and trying to stand in the way of her future. And when I said something like, this is the first I heard of this you know, signing this deed. She said, no, at the very first mediation, I talked about this and I said, you wanted me to say I would sign anything you put in front of me should, should it arise that you wanted to put your name on property. There's not too much more profound from this that I can think of. My attorney's gonna talk to the mediator at some point. That will be probably an expensive phone call. They'll try and work something out, then I'm assuming I'll talk to my attorney and then we'll figure out if there's a counter offer to be offered or mediation will fall apart. She is legitimately freaked out about my not signing the quick claim. Like that was real, like she was even crying at the end. And she uses the word fuck in mediation. She said something like, my work is getting transferred up there. If I don't get this property, my life is fucked or something like that. I, have to, I actually, after she said it, I took out my book and I wrote it down. I was like, hmm, but I don't care. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Everything she's doing is in her own best interests, so. Okay, I came to the barn for a while. I didn't actually pet any horses, but I talked to I talked to people on the phone. My trainer came by and asked how it was going, so I stopped and I talked to her for a bit, and that was really fun. It was cathartically fun to just talk about the situation and laugh a bit and to recount it firsthand, like in person relating to somebody being like, oh man, she she hates me and blah blah. You know, it was just it was really good to get that out. And then I met somebody who's there, who, uh, who I've seen a few times and I, ooh, hot air balloons. I should show you, hold on. Um, how pretty are those? Here, I'll zoom. I love that about here. Ha. It's just nice to talk to somebody I haven't talked to before. I've seen her a few times and just to have a oh, 10, 15 minute conversation about Oh, there she is. <laughs> she just she just followed me back uh, on Instagram. I was like, I follow you on Instagram. And uh, she's like, you do? What's your name? So I said, Ken's awesome. And she was like, yeah, she just thought the name was great. So uh, nice. Nice to have a connection with somebody. Um, yeah. The rest of the world is kind of quiet. Uh, I, I don't assume I'll hear from my wife again. <laughs> I don't feel like she likes me at all. Like, I think she hates me, I do. Like, it, you know, not being dramatic. I, like, the look on her face today when she looked at me was like, you are the worst fucking person in the world. So, careful about not giving someone what they want because they will hate you. <sighs> I think the plan going forward is let my lawyer talk to the mediator and have their discussion, consult with my lawyer about what I should do, and then make a counter offer that she probably won't take, and then we'll use attorneys. Um, the things I don't understand are if there is legitimately 
an issue with me not signing the quick claim and what the deal with the Epstein and Watts things are. You know, I've had people coaching me saying, you know, I have leverage and I should just ask for whatever and it's non-negotiable and, you know, if she wants out so badly, she'll agree to it. I have people telling me I should take alimony instead of like the, the, the buyout settlement. I, I don't know. You know, again, there's no rule book to this. How was your day? What did you get up to? I'm still trying to comprehend how I feel after that, that mediation session. I don't feel terrible. I don't feel great. I feel sort of like it happened. We disposed our finances. The, you know, we got rid of the paperwork side of things. I'm glad that's done with. I don't know how the rest of this is gonna play out, but I kind of feel like at this point, it will be whatever it's going to be. You know, it, it will become what it becomes. I don't think we will have to argue in person a lot more, and I will I will take whatever whatever my attorney tells me to do at this point. I'm gonna leave it in, in his hands. I'm gonna follow his advice. I will pay for that privilege, but I don't really have anything else to do. You know, it, it's, uh, it comes down to my counter offer, her accepting it or not, and then attorneys doing the work. The look she gave me today was one that somebody who hates somebody gives. Like, she hates me. She is pissed and really, really, really doesn't like me. Which is a little hard to take. It's not surprising, but it's hard to take. She kept telling me I'm standing in the way of her life. She's just trying to move forward. And I think my approach now is just to get out of this in the most favorable position possible. I'm not looking for more than I deserve, but I'm also not trying to get screwed over. I will catch up with you in the morning. Have a super evening.